Okay, if you have a Bible, open it to Matthew chapter 4, where we'll be today. You know, we've been walking through the whole Bible, right? We're 22 weeks in, and we have seen that this book right here is not a disconnected book, right? It is not a disjointed set of one-off moral lessons. No, it's a cohesive, unified thread from beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation. It is one singular story, one grand narrative. And really the high level view of that is creation, fall, redemption, right? Everything being good and right and beautiful in Eden, in the garden. But our sin entered in and fractured it all. And we lost that presence with the Lord. And from that point on, we've been trying to get back to Eden and we cannot on our own Thank the Lord in his mercy. He has offered to get us back and he has launched his rescue plan. We saw it in the Old Testament uh, in his making promises. And those promises have come to fulfillment at the arrival of Jesus at Christmas, right? The answer has now shown up. And in the last few weeks, we've kind of begun to see Jesus as an adult in the beginning of his ministry. Matthew 3 was his baptism. His identity was announced. Last week was the temptation in the wilderness, his identity was tested, right? Through kind of the main three basic temptations that all of us face regarding God's character, regarding our identity in him, and regarding our relationship together. And despite the extreme severity of the environment and the test that we saw Jesus undergo, he what? He passed the test, right? Where you and I have failed and continue to fail, Jesus succeeded and was victorious over Satan and sin. He trusted in his loving father. He rested in his sonship and he was joyfully satisfied in his relationship with the father. And in so doing, we saw what? Genesis 3 is now being reversed. Eden is beginning to be recovered as the righteous true and better Adam transfers his righteousness to us. Well, today we're going to see on the heels of that victory, Jesus launching his global movement, right? And as he does, he's going to speak something to a few disciples. But as he does that, he's going to speak the same things to you. And it's going to be very direct to you. Jesus has words for you. There's not many today. He has two words, two simple but powerful, non-ignorable words words for you today. Uh, how many of you guys know what a master class is? Yeah, anybody actually taken a master class? Okay, yeah, a few of you. Awesome. Yeah, so if you're not familiar, master classes is kind of this online library of videos, right, where you can access this content where kind of the world's best experts in all these fields are teaching you. Okay, And so you sign up for these different things. It's maybe 20 or so lessons. And these professionals, you know, supposedly teach you everything that they've learned in their entire life, right? It's awesome. Sounds great. Uh, you, you get this inside knowledge from these elite people all for, what, $15 a month. Amazing, right? And so if you're wondering, wow, why did I pay hundred grand for college then? <laughs> When I could just do this, hey, I get it. It's a valid question, right? Uh, just keep telling yourself that it was worth the experience, okay? That's what I do for myself. But there's a huge volume of master class, all different kinds of icons, Yo-Yo Ma, Steph Curry, Condoleezza Rice, all these big names, right? You can learn about acting or photography or business strategy or poetry. You can learn how to hit a forehand from Serena Williams, uh, how to write a film score from Hans Zimmer, right? Or how to grill a salmon from Gordon Ramsay. Really exciting things, right? Uh, negotiating is on there. Dog training is on there. And, of course, Texas-style barbecue is on there, right? Texas people, I can't believe you guys. It's not barbecue. It's Texas-style barbecue, right? Like, I'm sorry. I just hate non-Texas-style barbecue. It's a good thing we've got Texas-style on there. And the slogan they have is, they changed the world, now they'll change you. Okay? Ah, wow, this is really appealing, and it's wildly popular, 500 million in revenue type popular, right? Because, I mean, who, after all, doesn't want this kind of access to these people, right? Private instruction, well, on a video, right? Uh, Face-to-face on a screen, okay. But, But still, access to these kind of people. We're drawn to this, no doubt. Now, I think it's tapping into something deeper, though. 
Because we're yearning, this side of losing Eden, to be in the presence of, to hear the voice of, to watch the workmanship of, to glean the wisdom from a master. We recognize deep down that we're lacking something. We're not whole, and we're hoping that someone else can show us the way. Cue Matthew 4. Here we go. Starting today in verse 12. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, which is his hometown, he had just been kicked out of there. I don't know if you remember Luke 4, right? He preached there first to his hometown, and they tried to kill him. He went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun, and Naphtali. Okay, so he's now setting up his base operations. He's moving to uh, Capernaum, this town by the Sea of Galilee. And, and this happened, verse 14, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, catch this, 700 years earlier, might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region in shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. This is not where you'd expect the Messiah to come. The Messiah is going to come from, he's going to launch his ministry and movement. Where is he going to be? Jerusalem, right? The capital city. The Jewish jewel, right? Or at least maybe some kind of like Roman Empire, uh, huge metropolitan area, right? But not country Galilee. It even says Galilee, did you catch this, of the Gentiles. Because at that time, what had happened is Galilee is kind of on this trade route. So, so many foreigners over the centuries had begun to plant roots there that was barely even recognizable as Jewish anymore. There was so much intermixing. And you kind of got this obscure place here in which the light of the world is choosing to pierce the darkness. It's so surprising that later the Pharisees would laugh at the idea that the Messiah came from Galilee. Verse 17, he launches his public preaching. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, here's the distillation of his message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, we'll get into that next week, okay? So I'm just going to save the content of that message. But what we have is an unexpected place. Jesus is not coming where you'd expect Now let's keep going, because he's not coming to who you'd expect either. Verse 18. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. That's their identity. They were fishermen, and they were doing what fishermen do. They're fishing. Verse 19. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers. Of men. Uh, That's an interesting thing to say, right? (laughs) Bit cryptic, bit weird. Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Verse 20, what do they do? Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Wow. To lay down your assets, your career, your livelihood and security in a moment. I mean, most people would have brushed this guy off, right? Thanks for the offer, but... I'm good. I, I, these guys seem kind of crazy right here. Well, let's keep going. Maybe they're not the only crazy ones. Verse 21. And going on from there, Jesus saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with their dad, mending their nets. So they're fishermen too. They're on the job. And he what? And he called them. Kaleo. He called them. He probably said, follow me, just as he did to the other two, because look at the next verse. Immediately, they left the boat and their father, and they followed him, laid down the family business in a moment, and followed Jesus. This is unbelievable, right? Like, what a crazy story. Maybe you've heard this story so much that it, it seems commonplace. This is not common. To someone they seemingly just met says, hey, leave everything and come follow me. It seems pretty irrational and radical, doesn't it? Well, there's more to the story that helps us understand it. Let's go to Luke chapter 5 and read a parallel passage. 
Luke's going to give us more details. He often does. Luke 5, verse 1. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, also known as the Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon Peter's, he asked Peter to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So the crowd's pressing in on the shore. <laughs> He's got to kind of get out a little bit and to be able to project. So he gets on Peter's boat. Verse 4, And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now put out a, into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and we took nothing. We're fishing all night. I haven't got a thing, Jesus. Now, if that was me, that wouldn't be surprising, right? I fish for like six hours and get one perch. But these guys are pros, and they know these waters, and they've been fishing their whole life. To catch zero, this is quite unusual. But Peter says, at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. And they signaled to their partners, which are James and John, down the way in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both the boats so that they began to sink as they're trying to haul it on shore. The fish are overloading the boat. Verse 8, but when Simon Peter saw it, when he kind of understood what was happening, what's his response? Peter falls down at Jesus' knees, and what does he say? Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. Wow. Depart from me, O Lord. I'm a sinful man. He recognizes Jesus' lordship in this moment. It's undeniable, right? No one else has this kind of power but God. And his first response is what? I'm unworthy. I think of Isaiah, right? Isaiah 6, like he sees the vision of God. Woe to me, I'm, I'm unclean. Or Moses, when he sees God, he hears God in the burning bush, like you're on holy ground. It's immediately confronted with our unholiness in the presence of the majesty of Jesus. And what does he say? Get away from me. Get away from me. What does Jesus say? For he, verse 9, for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. So also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. I love his care here. I love his care for his boy, Peter. Don't be afraid, Peter. From now on, you will be catching men. And he probably said, like in Matthew, follow me in the middle of that. Because verse 11, when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Peter says, get away from me. Jesus says, follow me. Peter says, I'm sinful. You don't know who you're dealing with. I'm messed up, Jesus. Jesus goes, I know exactly who I'm dealing with. I'm going to draw near to you. Depart from me. No, no, no. Follow me. What an encounter. Now, synthesizing this with the other gospel accounts, we know from John chapter 1 that Jesus had actually already met Peter. This wasn't their first initial encounter, okay? Andrew, Peter's brother, had been following John the Baptist. And John the Baptist told his followers, I'm not the Messiah, but that guy is. And so Andrew left John the Baptist to follow Jesus. And Andrew went and got his brother, Peter, and said, hey, we found him. And Peter, this is John 1, comes and actually meets Jesus. That's when Jesus says, oh, so you're Simon. Yeah, I'm going to call you Peter. Peter now, right? So they were already loosely familiar before this account, and here comes this encounter, magnitude of this moment. Peter falls on his face, calls him Lord, and Jesus gains four committed followers. The stories continue. We see in Matthew 9, 9 that Jesus calls Matthew. <laughs> he calls Matthew to him, right? This is an interesting, quick-hitting verse that Matthew accounts of his own Testimony, look what Matthew's in the middle of doing. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, the tax collector. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Uh, I, I don't know if you understand tax collectors, but uh, this is probably the guy who's last on the list. 
Okay, so when we hire someone at the well or we think through elders or deacons, we have like this grid of C's, right? So calling and character and competency and uh, chemistry and all these things, right? Of course, they're alliteration. I'm, I'm doing it, right? I can't not think that way. Okay, and so we look at this dude, Matthew, and, and where is he at on the character side? Zero, okay? This is a dude who's tra- he's a traitor to his country, sold out on, on his Jewish people to go serve Rome. And by the way, he's collecting everyone else's money and on top, taking plenty of profits for himself. He's not an upstanding guy. Not only is he not an upstanding guy, the whole chemistry thing, throw him in with a bunch of Jews, this is a problem, okay? Like team dynamics, little clunky, okay? Not going well. We keep reading and we see Philip, we see Nathaniel, we see, begin to see the list of the disciples. Look at Luke chapter 6. We get kind of the main list of them. So up there, I'm just going to read it up there. Luke 6, in these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples, and he chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles. So here we go. Here's our list. Simon, whom we named Peter and Andrew, his brother, James and John. Okay, we got those. Philip and Bartholomew, also known as Nathaniel. We'll get to them in a minute. Matthew, we just hit on. Thomas, the doubter we know about later. James, the son of Alphaeus. Simon, who was called the zealot. And Judas, the son of James, and also Judas, Scariot, who became a traitor. Interesting. If you look at these people and you dig more into their character and bios, you're going to see this is largely a list of unimpressive people. It's not military generals, not wealthy nobles, not political leaders and civil servants. It's not a religious scholar even. It's not social media influencers, okay? Like if you're going to build a team, this is probably not who you go for. These are Bible school dropouts who are overwhelmingly ordinary. Some are married, some are single. I've already mentioned we've got the tax collector. You know who else is on the team? A zealot. Do you know who that is? Basically a private assassin who's leading a rebellion against Rome. Oh, okay. This is going to go well, right? This is who we've got on the team. We've got outspoken alpha male personalities. We've got background people. And we, you, you, you expand the scope a little bit. And you've got, we see from the other passages, Jesus calling people from Syria, the woman at the well, the Samaritan, Mary Magdalene, who was demon possessed. Jesus drove seven demons out of her. All of these people are coming together to follow Jesus. If you're going to start a movement, with, why would you choose this team? These are not first round draft picks. Why does he do that? Well, a few reasons. Number one, to show us he doesn't need anyone. (laughs) Sometimes Jesus' disciples are referred to as helpers. Ever heard that in kids' books and stuff? Jesus' helpers? I had to break it to you guys. Jesus doesn't need help. This isn't his little team of worker bees. Like, good job, little buddies. Jesus does not need help to accomplish his mission. This blows this concept up. If he needed help, he wouldn't have chosen these people. He doesn't need anyone, but number two, he does want everyone. What hope for us is this, right? Nobody is disqualified (laughs) from being on Team Jesus. No one is pre-screened and removed because of your background or your past sin or your skin color or where you grew up or your gender or anything else. We often disqualify ourselves for those reasons, right? Right? I didn't go to seminary. I don't know these things. What gifts do I have? Why would Jesus want me? Or we even disqualify others, man. They're so far gone. No way, that person, right? He does want everyone. Number three, he cares for each one. Why do you think all these individuals are named? Because they matter. Even if we don't know anything else about them, they each have a story. And it's speaking into why he has come. So we've got an unexpected place and an unexpected people, but we also have an unexpected purpose. Y'all remember in the Old Testament, we went through the sequence. I made you, I chose you, I saved you, I want relationship with you. Jesus is doing the exact same thing right here. And it's not because they were impressive, it's because he set his love on them. 
It's cluing us in right now to the purpose of this Messiah. The purpose of the Messiah is not global domination. It is individual discipleship. You say, what's discipleship? That's a very churchy word. What does that mean? Well, let me, let me kind of school us a little bit on the education system of the time. We've got some educators in here. I know you'll appreciate this. So at age four or five, a Hebrew boy or a girl would start their schooling, their training. And it would involve reading and writing and learning Torah, first five books of the Old Testament, right? That was the subject. By age 10, they would start to learn interpretation. At this point, most of the students would drop out. They would go home to work at home or learn the family trade. If you kept going, maybe by age 13, you began to uh, put into practice the different commandments. And then you started to learn how to synthesize the commentaries. And then you started to to be able to analyze and, and produce your own thoughts and critical thinking about the scripture. Once you're Your studies were beginning to to escalate. The best and the brightest would move on, and they would advance and receive more intensive training from a rabbi. A rabbi, it just means teacher, or master is the word. Once those studies completed, a student could then approach their rabbi, their master, and ask them if they could become his follower. The word in Hebrew, talmudim, in Greek, masetes, in English, disciple. Disciple. Disciple, to train, to teach. It's where we get the word discipline. It's, it's a word of formation and, and shaping. So they would come to the rabbi. Will you shape me? Will you form me? Will you teach me? Can I follow you? And the rabbi would agree or he would not agree. Most students, obviously, were turned away and they were rejected. <laughs> but if, if he said yes, if the rabbi saw, he word saw potential, In the student, the next stage of training, they would graduate. It's kind of like residency, only on steroids. It was very intense. It was a master class. And there would be this rigorous commitment to shadow the rabbi through all of life. We're not in a classroom lecture now. We're closely walking behind and observing their entire lifestyle. Okay? So you eat with them. You listen to them. You travel with them. You work with them. You watch them interact with their family and be a husband and parents. This is not 21st century school, right? This is the opposite. You're not studying for a test just to complete a course and get your degree and get out. This is intense devotion and intimate observation. And eventually be full on imitation because the goal of a disciple would in essence be to be an image of their rabbi. Interesting, right? Not just to learn from him, but to what become like him. That's the goal, to do what he does, say what he says, think like he thinks. In the Old Testament, the language here is called show, is, we would often use your ways. So show me your ways, Psalm 25, 4. That's what he's saying. God, show me your ways. Disciple me. Teach me how to be. <laughs> Does that make sense? I want to learn the way of my master, right? What he says, I want to say. What he feels, I want to feel. What he avoids, I want to avoid. What he weeps over and celebrates and feels righteous indignation towards, I want to also. Who he pursues and what he prioritizes, I want to also. Because someone's ways is just what? How they are. It's who you are. It's how you are. Um, Who would you say you've learned from most in your life? Think about that question. I think most of us would maybe point to some kind of coach or teacher, professor. um, Maybe someone that really taught us some kind of very poignant lesson or truth that has really stuck out to us. Maybe an author. Yeah, kind kind of an impact through a specific Lesson, But I would argue the person that you have learned the most about from life is without question 100% someone you have lived with. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. And you go, well, no, 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 no. No, no. Trust me. How you operate, (laughs) who you are without even thinking about it subconsciously has been most shaped by someone who's under the same roof. Mom, dad, step-parent, grandparent, brother, sister, spouse. It's most formed by someone who you are around the most, right? And that is the essence of this rugged life-on-life discipleship. To be a disciple was an all-in commitment. 
And so there was a phrase that kind of went around in the disciple world. And they would say, may you be covered in the dust of your master. Right? And the imagery there is as your rabbi's walking, you're walking so close to him that literally the dust his sandals are kicking up is coating you. And then when he is teaching and he's sitting in a chair, you're at his feet, his dusty feet is getting kicked up on you. Maybe you'll be covered in the dust of your master. Stay close to your rabbi. Your sole goal, and this was another lingo back then, was to take on the yoke of your master, okay? So the yoke, a a submission and adherence to your rabbi's teaching of scripture, interpretation of scripture, and practice of scripture. How they see and teach and do, you want to see and teach and do. You would be tied to him in an essence. So think about now Matthew 11. You may know the passage, right? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. By the way, come to me, dute in the Greek, same as Matthew 4, follow me. Follow me, come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Here it is. Take my yoke, this word, and what? Learn from me. Mathetes, disciple from me. That's what Jesus is saying. Wow. That's why Jesus came? Yeah, that's why Jesus came. That's why he's launched his worldwide mission in an obscure place with obscure people because he's not here for political overthrow. And he's not here to produce an amazing economy or start an amazing philanthropy. He is here for people. Reversing the sin of Genesis 3, he's after us, you guys. He's recovering Eden, but he's doing it one individual at a time. And so the rest of our time, I want you to see five things from these passages we've read today about the process of discipleship. This is vital that you get, and it starts, we've already seen it, with number one, Jesus sees. This is deeply personal. Deeply personal. Let's read John 1. I want to zoom in on Nathaniel and Philip for a moment. John 1, starting in verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip, and he said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Okay, now, Philip found Nathanael, and he said to him, we found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I love this. This is the lens of the day, the prejudice of the day, right? So unexpected he would come from Nazareth. And Philip said to him, what? Come and see. <laughs> I love that. Come and see. There's the invitation. Verse 47, Jesus saw Nathaniel. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him. And he said to him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. He said that to a guy he's never met before. Verse 48 is why Nathaniel said to him, how do you know me? (laughs) Right? Someone says that about you as you walk up to them. You're going, "Uh, who are you and how do you know me, dude? We've never met. Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Oh, and I get chills thinking about that. And you go, what's the fig tree? Where is that? that? We don't know. But we know that somehow, some way, this was some kind of momentous instant in Nathaniel's life. Perhaps he was under that tree at the end of his rope. Perhaps he was crying out to God in an angry prayer. Where have you been, Jesus? Where have you been, God? Where have you been? You're holding out on me. Life's not turning out as it's supposed to. Where's the Messiah, right? Do you even see me, God? And Jesus says, yes, I see you. I was there. And his supernatural knowledge, he tells Nathaniel, I was with you in that moment. I saw you before you ever saw me. Wow. And don't miss this. Jesus doesn't say, I saw y'all. I see all my children. I see all my followers. No, no, no. He says, I saw you. I see you. 
I see you, Peter. I see you, James. I see you, Martha. I see you, Mary. I see you. This is highly individual, intensely personal, right? Here we have a movement that will reach the entire globe. It's going to spread and transcend history and geography. It's so broad scale, and yet its initial sparks are not massive crowds or stadiums of people. They're small, specific encounters. Like, are y'all seeing that? There's no green rooms here. There's no backstage security. This is up close, firsthand, profoundly personal. Because Jesus' movement will not be crowd-driven and corporate and cold. No. The, the goal involves as many people, yes, as possible being redeemed, but yet the great multitude in heaven, we read Revelation, we stand before the throne one day with millions of others who called on the name of Jesus. We are not nameless and faceless to him. He knows each one of us. I saw you. He sees, he knows, and he's coming for you. Number two, Jesus pursues. So this is initiated by his Love. We see this consistent pattern in all these stories, right? Jesus makes the first move. Like he didn't wait for people to come to him and ask him to be their rabbi, did he? That's how it was supposed to go down that day. But he went to them, the dropouts, and said, you follow me. And the focus in all these passages is that Jesus saw first. He saw them. He saw first. He speaks first. He pursues first. Luke six thirteen. When we read him about choosing the disciples, the word is, he chose them. And you go, well, that's specifically like he's choosing the 12. Well, okay, John 15, 16, he says, very straightforward, you did not choose me, but I chose you. <laughs> I don't know how more direct you can get than that. Well, again, Tyler, that's not for all Christians. That's just specifically, he's talking about setting aside the 12 Okay, John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6, I can't get around this one. And he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Who's the us? Well, he's talking to all the Christians in Ephesus. Us. This is all believers. He chose us in love, having predestined us before the foundation of the world to the praise of God's glorious grace. He chose, Colossians 3.12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, 1 Thessalonians 1.4. For we know brothers loved by God. There's the theme of love in the middle of all this, that he has chosen you because the gospel came to you, 1 Peter 2.9. But you're a, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, all Old Testament language, by the way, connecting us to the chosen people, Israel. Jesus redefining who's chosen. It's not his disciples, his followers, all the same word, eklegomai in the Greek. I could keep going on and on with this word, but you get the point. You're chosen. In fact, the word ekklesia, which comes from that, is our word for church. It means what? Chosen ones. Called out ones. Now, I, I know I know in a room this size, this makes many of you uncomfortable to think about being chosen. I don't know why, all totally why. It's interesting. You watch the show, right? <laughs> chosen, you don't have a problem with that. Um, I, if, if you're married, you chose your spouse. Like, I love to remind my wife all the time, I chose you. Out of all the people in the world, I, I chose you. I selected you. You. In fact, uh, a few years ago, and, uh, for our anniversary, I wrote a song. It's not good, because I'm not good. That's why I'm not up here. <laughs> but the title of the song is, I'd Choose You Again. Right? I, I love to remind her that. Like, I, I chose you, and I would choose you again. In case you forget, in case you doubt, you are chosen. This is a cherished reality for the people of God, of his initiating love to be selected and pursued and chosen by him. And it makes us uncomfortable. Why? I think, honestly, this is hard for you, some of you to hear. I think the real reason is our pride and ego. Because we want to be able to say, I chose him first. I, ha I, I did this and the reality that he came to us first is a little bit 
I'm comfortable. No, I decided this. I found him. John 1, that's what Philip said. Did you catch that in verse 45? Philip found Nathaniel, and what did he tell Nathaniel? We found Jesus. Now, interestingly enough, right before that in verse 43, it was what? Jesus found Philip. <laughs> who found f- who first? Jesus, yes, right? The fray, they got it right in that song, right? You found me, okay? I didn't find you. You found me. In fact, Paul, Philippians 3, 8, it's going to describe salvation in this way, being found in him. That's what it means to be saved. You were lost, he found you. And this is necessary, church, because Romans 3 is going to say that no one seeks God. No one seeks God. For this relationship to be restored, Jesus must take the initiative. He must call you. Ephesians 2 calls us dead in our sins and transgressions. In other words, if I lived a million years, I would never in a million years all of a sudden decide on my own to pursue Jesus as my rabbi. That's not the trajectory because I'm a dead disciple of this world and dead disciples don't change themselves. That people don't go to Jesus and ask him to be the rabbi, he goes to them. And if that's still troubling you, I just say this with tenderness, it probably means your view of the slavery of sin is just too light. You need a deeper understanding of the depravity of our hearts. He has to make the first move. And praise God, he does. It's not only necessary, y'all, it is beautiful. Because being chosen gives security in the love of Jesus. It gives you security in this relationship, both now and eternally. Whatever insecurity you have, whatever anxiety about your status with God, this this silences that. Because his love wasn't dependent on you when he called you. And therefore, it's not today either. And it won't be when you stand before him at the gate of heaven. It's fixed. Nothing can separate you from his love. Let me say it this way. He doesn't unchoose you any more than a parent unadopts their kid. Thank God you are chosen. Well, how do I know if I'm chosen? Well, you're here today. You're hearing him say, follow me, aren't you? If you've responded to him and followed him, then guess what? He's chosen you. Because number two does not negate number three. Jesus calls. You see, Jesus' pursuit, his choosing love, doesn't negate our responsibility to respond, does it? He doesn't force this relationship. He calls. Catch this. This call requires decisive commitment from us. Let me say that again. It requires decisive commitment from us. Right? There's a a definitive abandoning of your former life and a wholehearted submission to Jesus. We've already talked about this. It's an all-in concept of this dusty Discipleship. This is why these disciples left everything and followed him, right? Because there's no halfway in. You don't dip your toes into discipleship. It's a costly choice to follow Jesus. And we're going to read about that more and more as we progress through the book of Matthew, right? Because it's going to involve denying yourself and taking up your cross to follow him. It's, Jesus is going to say, you might even have to leave father or mother. You might have to abandon your family or your future, anything that's going to get in the way of you following me because you cannot serve two masters. So it's really key that you get number two, Jesus is pursuing love for you, does not negate number three, your responsibility to respond and commit to him. You tracking with that? It makes sense how that, this fits together? Okay, this is a specific call. You have to make Jesus your rabbi. And you will be held accountable for that as I will So, number four, though, these disciples, they don't know everything yet, right? When Jesus approaches them, they haven't arrived. They're not mature. This requires an all-in, but number four, Jesus transforms. This will change you. He doesn't call the qualified and experienced and those with a stacked resume. He calls those who are ready to change, those who are in process. And the goal, do you see it in these passages, is to take and exchange an old life for a new life. Catch the language, I will make you fishers of men. Ah, (laughs) ha. Jesus is saying, I will turn you into this. You don't have to have it together right now because as you follow me, I will form you. You catch that? As you follow me, I will form 
you. Jesus calls us where we're at, doesn't he? He interrupts us where we're at. He comes to the tax booth. He comes to the boat. He comes to wherever you were, a dorm room, uh, working in your yard, hospital room, right? Right here at the station. I don't know. He comes to you where you're at, but he does not leave us where we're at. He transforms us. And that's what discipleship is. Again, Peter's name change. Oh, I find that so interesting, right? He meets Peter for the first time. Oh, you're Simon. <laughs> you're going to be Peter. <laughs> right? Like, who's this guy changing my name? Like, but Jesus, yes, he saw Simon as he was, but he also saw who he was going to make him into. The same is true for every one of us. Praise God. As you follow me, I will form you. He's redefining their identity, but he's also redirecting their activity. Number five, finally, Jesus compels. This doesn't stop with you, church, because Jesus isn't calling us to a holy huddle, like an exclusive club of elites. This is for everyone. And on some level, this is totally natural, right? Like, as the greatness of Jesus invades your life, you can't help but draw others into that greatness with you. This is what we do. We talk about what's amazing and satisfying and awesome, right? We let the world know, come and see. Come and see. Come experience Jesus for yourself. It's so good. I have to tell you about him, right? That's how some of these people found out from a brother, from a coworker, from a friend. It's one of the primary ways Jesus does pursue people is through us in our uncontainable joy spilling over. Notice I say what? Uncontainable joy. Not obligation. Not chore. Not, hey, you got to make sure you share the gospel with five people this week. Or you may, may not be saved. No. Uncontainable joy. I can't help but speaking about what I've seen and heard. We saw it in the book of Acts, didn't we? If the gospel explodes in people. It explodes out of people. But it's also not just natural, it is also necessary. Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men. You're going to start catching people, not just fish. There is a new mission and purpose that he calls us into. Why? Because people must know. Come and see why. Because people must know. What we are inviting people into is not something superfluous and trivial. It's not like, hey, if you have time, this new trendy fad I'm into is really cool. You should really come learn calligraphy with me or come to my goat yoga class. That's not what we're inviting people into, right? This is life or death. This is essential. Come and see because people must know. How will they Believe if they don't hear, how will they hear if no one tells them? Jesus has chosen you to be a conduit. And just like the catch on the shore, it's not going to be you catching the fish. It's just you hauling them in. Jesus is doing all the work. Okay. If the band comes up, what's the point of all this, Tyler? Well, Jesus could accomplish his mission apart from us, could he not? But he doesn't. He's chosen to accomplish his mission in us and thereby through us because redemption is not going to be this distant mass transaction it is a personal transformation played out on the canvas of daily discipleship two simple words for you today two simple words follow me you can't avoid them and you can't ignore them can't waffle with him. He's chosen to pursue you. So let me ask, is there a decisive moment when in your life you responded to that call with a commitment? Have you put your yes on the table? I'm in. I am yours, Jesus. Are you a follower of Jesus? I love using that language. I think in our day and age, Christian kind of has been uh, very diluted. Like, yeah, you check that box on the census, right? No, no, are you a follower of Jesus? Well, my mom's a saint of a Christian. That's not what I'm asking. My dad was a minister. Well, I go to church. Well, I tithe. Well, I know the answer is that's not what I am asking. Are you a follower of Jesus? You know, you are being discipled by something or someone. The question is, is it Jesus? If you don't know the answer, it means it's probably you. 
You're discipling yourself. But Jesus is calling you to decisive shift where, as Paul says, you walk from a former life to a new life. Where all of your life now has a before and after moment, right? Even if you can't discern that exact moment, everything is pre-Jesus or post-Jesus. Do you have a former life? He's inviting you into that today. He's calling you right now. Not if he calls you, he is calling you. For those of us who have responded to that calling, I'm going to reframe the question a little bit. Let me ask it different. Are you following Jesus? Are you following Jesus? You know, maybe you're in here, and I know many of you are, because I walk with you. I know that many of you are racked with shame and guilt. You're like, the whole time I'm preaching, you're just like, I'm failing the master class. I'm terrible at this. And the enemy is assaulting you with guilt and shame right now because you're like, I'm not staying close to my rabbi. I don't even know when the last time is I opened his words, let alone talk to him. Here's the good news. God loves people who are failures. (laughs) Who else is there, right? That's why he came and that's why he called you. Remember, he didn't need you. He called you. And listen, he never expels his disciples. A disciple is not a master. A disciple is a learner. So by very definition, you're in process. So take a deep breath and feel the freedom and relief of knowing that your master is the master, not you. Now, does your distance with God grieve him? Yes. Does he eagerly desire your wholehearted commitment to him? Yes. But he doesn't have buyer's remorse, y'all. I don't know. You need to hear that. I know many of you struggle to actually believe that. Like, no, maybe in 10 years when I get my trash together, then he will love me. No! He saw where you would be and he still called you. And you know what? He chose you again. Don't believe that. That is a lie from the enemy. He saw last week, he's pleased with you and it's not based on your performance, church. Today's the day to run to his feet. Jesus, I don't want to live this way any longer. Forgive me. He will change me. He will. Jesus, be my rabbi. He will. Because he loves to teach people who are eager to be taught. We're going to sing in a minute, Jesus, teach me to abide. That is our prayer today. I want to end with a story from John 21. as the disciples in, we get this glimpse of needing our calling to follow him to be renewed. I love our boy Peter. He gives us so much hope and encouragement, doesn't he? You know, he abandoned Jesus the night he was betrayed. He, he followed at a distance and eventually he betrayed him. Look what Jesus does in John 21 to restore our boy. Verse 4, just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore And yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. You see the repeat story here? And the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Peter heard it was the Lord, what did he do? He stripped down and jumped in the water, right? And just swam to Jesus. Couldn't wait to get there. And their ensuing conversation, Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? He's like, of course I do. And he asked him again, do you love me? Of course I do. Do you love me? Jesus, you know I love you. But he got the point three times, just as he betrayed him three times. And in so doing, Jesus was restoring him to himself, offering forgiveness and recommissioning him. Because look what he says at the end. Doesn't mince words, verse 19. He tells Peter what kind of death he's going to experience, okay? And it's brutal. He's going to be crucified upside down, y'all. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after he said this, he said to Peter, what? Follow me. Some of you need to hear the call again. Follow me. You heard it many years ago, and he's saying it again. Follow me. Peter turned, and he looked at John, and he said, but Jesus, what about him? And Jesus goes, what is that to you? I'll do with John what I want. You follow me. Let's pray, church.
Jesus, thank you. Who are we that you would be mindful of us? We are one in billions, and yet you see me. You know our name. You've interrupted our story to give us a former life. In love, you have pursued us and chosen us, and you are calling us to a decisive commitment to be covered in your dust, Jesus. Help us, because we are failures. We don't stay close to you. We don't cling to you. We don't abide in you. Would you help us? We thank you that you are not disappointed in us. You're not sitting there wishing we were further along. Oh, what a a failure of expectations we are. No, Jesus, you knew what you were getting into and you still chose us and you're still committed to us today. We thank you for the security of your love. We want to follow you. Teach us to abide. Amen.